Hello, everyone. Stucky like, here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the History of Everything podcast. And now actually also on YouTube because we have the camera finally set up. Hey, yeah, for all you watching. Hello there. For those of you listening. <laughs> also, hello there, even though you can't really see me right now. So now before we go ahead and begin today, I'm just going to go ahead and give the previous announcements that we always do. Uh, if you want to add free episodes, make sure to check us out on Patreon because we also release bonus episodes there for only a dollar a month. Simultaneously, make sure if you want to travel with us that you check out our trips down in the description. And without further ado, anyway, this episode is on Bodica. I think one of our patrons, I'm pretty sure it was our patron, left that request and we're like, absolutely. Oh, we have a whole number of things that we have to actually go and create. There's so much here. But Bodica specifically, Gab, actually, how familiar are you with the history of Bodica? You talk about it quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, in terms of famous warrior queens or like it, it, in terms of famous female figures in history, she's definitely one of the most famous ones. Revenge arc. Yes. I would also argue that she one of the only reasons, and I'm saying this, this is going to sound bad. I think Bodica is overrated. I know those are fighting words. I know a bunch of people in the comment section of the YouTube are probably going to be saying things off the first I'm place. I'm about to swing. What do you mean the people? We're, the threat is inside the room. <laughs> listen, we're going to be getting into the story, but the only reason, in my opinion, the only reason that she has talked about as much as she is, is specifically because of the British. That is it. It is because she is a massive figure within like British history overall. She's an iconic figure and like a statue. No one really talked about her all that much until that big statue of her was built back in like, I think it was in the Victorian era. Either way, just tell us the story and we'll be the judge of that. Okay, that's perfectly Not fine. Not to here. be snarky. No, that's perfectly oh, yeah. fine. She is still a very big figure in, in history here, right? So Bodica, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this was the Celtic queen of the Iceni or I, I Chini. It depends upon where you are for how you're actually going to pronounce it. But the I, I, I hear it more often as the Iceni. And the Iceni were a tribe in what is, well, modern day England, right? So it's just one of those things. Uh, they were located in East Anglia, which is on the, as the name implies, the eastern side of England there on the southern part of Britain. And there in 60 and 61 AD, she went and led what is arguably one of the largest revolts against Rome in Roman history at the time, managing to rally behind her huge amounts of tribes from all across Britain there in order to be able to revolt against Roman rule when they were initially trying to take things over. Did it work? No. Oh my God, it failed spectacularly. And of course, that's going to be a little bit of a spoiler going into this for those of you who are unfamiliar with history, I guess. But in most cases, people are probably aware that she is a tragic figure in history because she's one of those ones that, yes, her cause against Rome was, if the history is right, in my opinion, fully justified. But what she did, she, well, she did a lot. Okay. She wasn't just like a warrior queen. She, um, she went on a little bit of a psychotic murder spree. Is it on par with that St. Olga of Kiev? Yes. Yes, it's on par with Olga of Kiev, easily. Yes, yes. Though, in actually, for circumstances dealing with family, very similar. Usually, when you have tragic, like female characters in history, that is something that usually happens associated with their family, and then they kind of go crazy afterwards. Understandably, considering what if the stories are right, what happened to her. But we're going to be getting into that. So, before we actually get ahead of ourselves and talk about Bodica, we need to explain the context behind all this in the first place and how it is that we even got here because the actual story of Boudicca is very, is pretty short, but the Roman occupation of Britain, that is something that is longer. So we have to go in and kind of explain the context of how we even got there in the first place. So prior to the arrival of the Romans, Britain, which was originally there known as Albion, or at least that was one of the names that it had. There were a lot of different names for the region overall. This was something that was mostly comprised of these smaller Iron Age communities, a lot of these small tribal communities that were primarily agrarian. They were, again, tribal, and they had typically small enclosed settlements, and there weren't really necessarily any extensive kingdoms. Like you had some that would rise and then fall fairly quickly, which is something that tended to happen among tribal societies that would grow, gather strength, and then once a new leader would arise, everything that the previous empire controlled would pretty much fall apart. That's that's usually what ends up happening with a lot of these things in history. So anyway, Southern Britain would oftentimes share a lot of their culture with what we would associate as Europe, really. 
So a lot of the tribes had closer relations and specifically the ones that were in the southern parts of England shared a lot of their culture with northern Gaul, right, which is modern day France and Belgium and that sort of region. Many of the southern Britons were of uh, Belgian in origin. So which, Belgian? Oh, oh, yeah. I love how you brought that up. Ironically enough, Belgium is an artificial state. For anyone who is not aware of this, Belgium is an artificial state that has no actual historical basis for necessarily for it being its own separate entity. I've been saying this for years. How many Belgian rants have I gone on? Mainly it's to do with French fries, but <laughs> so there's, still. there's a number of different groups, right? You have the, you have the people like Flanders, you got the Wallonians, you have all like all the different groups, but Belgium was created as a state specifically to be a buffer between France and like everything else. I, Why? Napoleon. A lot of things in history, when talking about European history, going back to the 1800s, you can literally answer with, because Napoleon. I've seen a Napoleon movie. He wasn't that great. No, no, they really screwed that over. I'm going to do a video on that here for the Napoleon thing. They, they really screwed that up. And I, it pisses me off because I was looking forward to that. But anyway, you had the Belgian tribe, which that when Belgium was created, that is where their name came from. Like they took inspiration from the ancient tribe that occupied the region. And they shared uh, effectively a common language with them. In fact, Past 120 BC, trading between Transalpine Gaul, which is, you know, that's, that's like Gaul from uh, like across the Alps. That's what that means. So they would import massive amounts of goods from these regions here. We're talking about wine. We're talking about there even being evidence of coins and stuff being used. Gaul was way more developed than what a lot of people give it credit for, even with it still being tribal. And it's one of the things that made it a valuable target still for Julius Caesar to launch his campaigns in there because Rome meant expansion. And the thing about Rome and expansion is that expansion, do you know what that leads to? Or expansion literally just means taking more stuff over. Because, so did they use it as a staging point? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was the big point because once you take over one territory and you've paid your troops cause you got all this loot and you have everything else, um, you needed more money to pay your troops. So you need to expand more so that you can get more loot to pay your troops. And then once you can't expand anymore, you can't keep as large of an army and everything kind of collapses because now you have no one to defend because defending doesn't get you loot to pay your troops. There you go. Yes. That is precisely one of the things that would happen. Well, that was that, a lot. It was a lot, but you see that time and time again with history. I know we actually covered that when we did the episode here this previous week on the, uh, not the Genpei war, but like the Mongol invasion. Yeah, defensive wars usually don't really pay unless it's going into modern times where you can actually do stuff for indemnities and whatnot. But generally speaking, you don't really get as much. And so although Julius Caesar's campaign didn't exactly result in conquest when he went over and actually invaded Britain, it was this intense trade. And some claim that even the southern tribes in England had actually sent troops, supplies and aid and everything else across the channel in order to be able to help their kin. At least that was the claim that Caesar would make here that would justify why they would invade so that across the channel in like 54 and 55 BC, Caesar would end up then going and invading. So previously the channel or Mare Britannicum as it would be called, this is something that had always served as a kind of natural border between the European mainland and the islands. And so during his subjugation of Gaul during the Gallic Wars, Caesar wanted to cut off the Belgian. I'm, I'm going to say it's, I know it's the Belge, but I, I'm going to say Belgium because it's, it, it sounds better in this case. But their borders were probably different. Yeah. I mean, it occupied the region, which is where the name got from, but yeah. So, okay, fine. The tribes. He wanted to cut off the trade from the tribes because these were very hostile to specifically the Romans. But the wine. Well, yeah, but trade. No, no, not allowed. Not allowed at all. They wouldn't want that. So he wanted to interrupt the trade, and he also, again, assumed that the Britons were helping their kindred, Belgae. Later, this is something that he would then use to rationalize the invasion and also say that the island was rich in silver. Was it rich in silver? No. It did he have lied. Other, it did have other minerals, particularly the most valuable thing that Britain had overall in this region was tin, because tin was something that... A lot of people think, oh, like a tin, like tin cans. Yeah, that's not valuable at all. No, it is. Back in the day was valuable. Oh, particularly. What did they use it for? Tin mixed with copper makes bronze. Bronze is used for just about everything. They didn't use it necessarily as much for weapons or whatnot anymore. Like you didn't have the bronze age weapons because they had moved on to iron. 
but you still had bronze for stuff for like mirrors and all different kinds of things that would be used. So what caused the Bronze Age collapse since we're talking about bronze? We can do that for an episode, but there's a lot of different things. You are trying to drive me into a trap here. I am. I know. I love talking about the Bronze Age collapse. Okay, fine. Side note here, my personal opinion when it comes to no, the Bronze his Age. his conspiracy theory. No. His personal conspiracy theory. Is, so you know how you have the sea peoples and everything else in there, right? So the thing is, I believe that since the Bronze Age was specifically something that was driven by bronze, which is made out of tin and copper and across the Mediterranean, there are very, very, very few sources of tin and copper. Like there are very few. They only come from select regions. If even one of those mines dry up, you're, you're basically going to have a collapse of an entire system. So I believe that it's a combination between weather, outside powers, like in the case of the Sea Peoples disrupting trade, and mines going dry, because that would effectively stop the creation of any kind of tools. Like you'd still have what it is that you previously had. We need to do an episode on this because I have some theories of my own. I had to take Old Testament in college for a Bible university. And boy, did we dive into that. Wait, 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 that was a big section? Yeah, it was really decent when you set up the entire background of the Old Test, New Testament. One of the Testaments, those classes blurred together. I think it was New Testament, though, because that was the harder class. They don't just teach the text. They teach the historical and cultural context. It's like a history class. Hmm. And so I guess, well, the interesting thing about this is that even with all, all the time that this is taking place and all this trade is occurring, right, the Republic did know about the island's existence. But Britain, for the most part, was completely unknown to Rome. Like they didn't know really any of the details inside of it. And this was something that the people thought like, oh, it was this mystical land beyond the waters, right? There was all these stories about things beyond the, yeah, yeah no, basically. Uh, it, that, that, that's one of the things that has a tendency to happen when talking about with stuff with ancient history. The amount of ancient weird beliefs that people had towards India and everything. I have weird beliefs towards Britain, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but they had all these weird, crazy practices. You know, one of the most Beans disgusting- on toast? Well, yes, but even worse, they did something even more terrible and awful to the Romans. They drank milk. Me? <laughs> I'm Roman. Milk is disgusting. No, it's not. Milk is amazing. Okay. No, I'm- Listen, listen. I haven't even evolved to be able to tolerate milk, okay? It's gross. You're not supposed to be drinking something you have to like- Grow to tolerate. Be honest with yourself. No, milk is amazing. It's, it truly is. No. Dairy products are wonderful. And I'm telling you this right now. Guys, in the comments right no. now, right now, you have to side with me or him. Milk superiority. So you type milk is gross or milk is great. Milk superiority. Black. And we'll tally this. This is a serious election. I don't want to see double comments. That is voter fraud. I'm going, to, I'll put it on a YouTube poll that just says, is milk good? <laughs> yes, no. It is vile. <laughs> I'm going to do that. and I'm going to link it to this episode. So for all the people, when I put this out on the YouTube community page, when people see this, they better type in the comments. I came from the poll. Like literally just put that in there. This is oat milk before y'all start to try to come for me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, right. That when I, when I was doing the research to figure out this episode, when I saw that whole section on milk, I thought this is hilarious. I'm now going to do an entire episode for Patreon that is dedicated to the, uh, the history of hating milk. And I'm going to be two pages of that. Yeah, which I, listen, it's, it, it's a side note, I know, but I have to express it because the whole thing is really funny. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a detail of the stuff that I found. Right? You're so excited about your milk bag. I know I am, right? So of course, during the, the visit to conquer Britain, which yes, that is literally the best way that I can phrase it. The visit to conquer Britain, because that's what they did the first Just time is they straight up had a holiday. visit. Yeah. So Caesar was disgusted by how much milk apparently that the northers, northerners there would consume. Me. And so there is a uh, Strabo, right, who is an ancient philosopher and a geographer and historian of ancient Rome, who he just, he mocked the Celts for their excessive milk drinking. And Tacitus, who's another Roman senator and historian, would describe the German diet as being crude and tasteless by singling out their fondness for curdled milk. Which Gross. I mean, to be fair, it's like curdled milk, but I mean, you'd use that then for cheese and other stuff, but it's besides the point. The Romans would often comment on how inferior other cultures were and which, you know, there's a thing referring to them as barbarians, but one of the marks that they would use to describe them as being inferior were milk drinkers. Because you're, you're touching a cow's 
to get the milk. I too side with no, the Romans. No, no, that, that wasn't why. That wasn't why. That it, truth be told, be <laughs> truth be told, there is a reason. And honestly, looking at the justification for why they would think that it was disgusting and bad makes sense when you break it down to it. It wasn't pasteurized. Well, no, like even when it comes down to stuff like butter, right? They would use butter as an ointment. You didn't use that for flavoring on bread or other stuff. You oh, did I didn't think about butter. I do enjoy some butter. Yeah. So as Pliny the Elder would put it, there's a quote I have here. The choicest food among barbarian tribes is butter. <laughs> like, which sounds like such a mocking thing to say in the first place. And I know I'm going to go into a whole thing on this. It's, it's not like milk drinking wasn't something that was done at all in Rome. It was. It just, you didn't do it on. Excessively. Well, not only did you not do it excessively, you didn't do it in the cities or anything else like that. Milk was something that in the warmer Mediterranean climate would spoil very quickly, right? So you didn't use it for, like, you, you didn't have it for regular consumption. Anyway, moving on from the milk episode that I want to really create here for Patreon, Caesar's initial contact with the, uh, with the tribes didn't exactly go over great. He had to very quickly reorganize his army in order to avoid defeat because he had pretty much underestimated them, which is not a good thing. And then during his second invasion, when he was accompanied by five legions, he would go and push northward all across the Thames River to meet with a Briton chieftain by the name of Cassivellaunus, which is a name here that I'm going to have a little bit of difficulty pronouncing, but it's in there. It's in there. And although this guy was joined for battle by several other chiefs, in order to avoid having to go back and cross the English Channel where potentially there was going to be really poor weather, because my God, was the weather of the channel very bad. Historically speaking, this is not something that was... Um, very easy to traverse. And there's a key reason as to why they associated Northern barbarians as actually being great shipbuilders because their boats actually could deal with choppy waters of like the channel and going into the North sea in comparison to the, um, the, the, the boats of the Mediterranean, which would just capsize immediately if they tried to build in that same style. Yeah. Not, so the Mediterranean was much gentler, way calmer, way, way, way calmer. It was just the, the completely different styles of boats that would have to work there. So what Caesar did was basically pretend that he had some major problems that were going on in Gaul and just be like, ah, yes, I came, I saw, I conquered, I left that shit. <laughs> and that's, 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 that's literally what he did. So he arranged a peace treaty with Cassivellaunus and then returned back to the European mainland without leaving a garrison, meaning that he conquered the territory and then didn't actually conquer it because he didn't leave any kind of garrison behind that would actually be able to maintain the territory that they took in the first place. He just tapped out. How did people feel about that? Um, a number of people were very happy when it came to the common people because, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, Rome achieving its greatness, doing all the great stuff because that's Roman doing that. A bunch of elites, though, were very displeased with this, thinking that the whole thing was a massive waste of money, time, resources and everything. There's a, a number of famous quotes about this. And one of those, I think I haven't even right here. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, Cato and Strabo. Oh, Strabo would write about this in the late Republic saying, and I quote, the only thing of value in this land is hunting dogs and slaves. And milk. Oh, God, no, they, did. <laughs> they didn't like milk. Buttery, Gabby. buttery goodness. No, no. But either way, they, they would just outright say, yeah, no, Britain had literally nothing, which is somewhat fair but also unfair because Britain did have a number of valuable resources like in the case of like oh it's mines like in the case of tin Caesar said that it had a bunch of silver it did not really have a lot of silver the big thing that it had largely was tin and other metals that could be used for Roman industry tin lead these kinds of things and tin was very useful because it was needed to make copper no, copper. Bronze. 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 You mix tin with the copper. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mix the tin and you mix the copper and you make bronze. And that's a very rare thing. A lot of people don't even realize this because they think, oh, yeah, bronze. You know, bronze came before iron and everything. So, I mean, it was probably way more common and people used that. No. Tin and copper were very, particularly around the Mediterranean. Which brings me to my next question. What caused the Bronze Age oh, collapse? Oh, God, no, you're going to try and trap me in this. No. Of it's, course, I'm going to trap you. Okay, guys, he has a very specific conspiracy theory for the Bronze Age collapse. It's, it's not a conspiracy the okay. theory. It's a logical theory, okay. right? It's, it's a just, logical conspiracy theory. Okay, my personal theory when it comes to the Bronze Age collapse is that people like say, oh, it's because they ran out of, you know, materials. Oh, it's because of 
climate change, like, you know, the, the natural disasters and stuff like the big volcanic eruptions. Oh, it's because of the sea peoples. I think it's a bit of a combination of all that. But I think that my, my biggest idea is that tin and copper were only mined in a few very select areas around the Mediterranean. The majority of that had to be imported, right? So if even a single one of those mines ends up expiring, right? If they, if they run out of, uh, if they run out of material within it to actually mine, this means that a huge aspect of trade goes with it. And that means people can't make tools. They can't make tools. They can't make weapons. They can't make literally anything that is used for the bronze age society. One of the other things is they would use the bronze to make coins. That means you wouldn't have coins that could actually be used here for trade or other Just stuff. Just like 10 coins. Oh yeah. And then it wouldn't have the same value. Improvise, adapt, overcome. <laughs> They wouldn't be able Make to. Make a ginormous tin coin. It's just, a, it's just, just do like the Spartan thing where it's like uh, the iron rods where it's like they, they, they didn't trade in coins because they didn't want people to actually trade with them. They wanted to be self-sustaining uh, and they hated the idea of outside trade and influence. So the way they would trade is through little rods of iron. They were bulky and horrible See, for trading. They improvised and they adapted and they overcame. But we should do an episode on the Bronze Age class because I have a lot of theories. Oh, you do? Because right? of Old Test, New Testament. It was oh, New Testament. You had to take that for your Christian school. You yeah, went to. but basically it was like more history, culture, and oh, then a yeah. little bit of like, just to give an idea of why the New Testament would exist. But we did go over the Bronze Age class. That, okay, that makes a, a lot. lot of sense. That does. In great detail. Well, anyway, in the case of Caesar, uh, the, he had to leave because there were still some problems that they had in Gaul. Like they had a, uh, there was a failed harvest and everything that had occurred at the time. And possibly there was going to be a rebellion. So he goes and dips out of there. And everyone is horrified, uh, or not everyone is horrified, but it's like the elites are horrified about his invasion in the first place and don't want anything to happen. And Britain kind of stays at peace. Th I, not at peace. I mean, it's obviously fighting among all the different tribesmen, but Rome at least does not go and invade it for like another century again. And that brings us to Claudius. So at the death of Caesar and the civil war that would follow, the Republic was no more. It was now the Roman Empire. And the new empire's interest in Britannia would intensify under the leadership of a number of different emperors. But the one who would actually go and do something about this was Claudius. And it's kind of funny that this whole thing even happens in the first place because in 43 AD, right? Emperor Claudius, with an army of four legions and auxiliaries under the command of Aulus uh, Palladius, he goes and crosses the English Channel, landing at Rickborough, and they begin the conquest of the island, right? Some believe that the emperor only went in the first place to achieve glory because remember the whole thing with Rome and like how they achieve glory is through war. You have to have some victories under your belt in order to do anything with politics. So, I mean, there's that. Also, there's the fact that Claudius had spent the majority of his, uh, his life there in terms of politics under the boot of Caligula. Not Caligula. Horse no. guy, ocean guy. He was constantly being abused and mocked by Caligula. Caligula was a little quirky. bit of a shit to him. He's quirky. Oh, to say the least. Biggest, funniest part about all this, and we're going to get into the actual details of the invasion itself, is Claudius only shows up to this invasion for like 16 days. That's it. He is part of the campaign for 16 days. And then at, when victory is declared, he just takes credit for all of it. It's the same energy as on The Great, like Catherine The Great, that Hulu show, where oh, yeah. they do this whole hunt and then all of like the king's men pin the animal they're hunting. The king just comes <laughs> over and shoots it. And then he takes all the glory. They're like, oh my God, the king's such Look, an amazing hunter. Amazing. Truly wonderful. This is superb. I've never seen such shooting skill from a point blank range. Yeah, literally. He walks right up to it and shoots it. And everyone's like, oh, wow, he's brilliant. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was the great. I don't know. It, it might have been something no, else. but it, it did happen in the great. Yeah, that wasn't the great because um, th there was a number of different cases like that where he would. Um, Just take glory. Yeah. Yeah. Which was all. I mean, the great is not historically accurate. It's, it's not. But it's, it's very funny in how it actually presents things. I enjoy it. It is. So, okay. As it got the, canceled. Sorry. Oh, unfortunately, it did. It was still funny. It was still good. It's just it wasn't accurate in the things that it changed because I'll say this right now. Side note from this. And I know I mentioned it when we did the episode on Catherine the Great. They made Peter in that. A lot dumber than he was or a lot smarter than he was. Lucky. They made him way more lucky than he actually was. He lasted way longer in there than he actually did. 
It, he it also just, seemed to have not a lot of charisma, but slightly more. Slightly which I guess more was charisma necessary. and way more psychotic. Yeah, th- I think they had to keep it that way to keep the interest, which mm-hmm. is fair. No, no, it, it is definitely fair here. So, okay, as for the actual details of the campaign, right? The Roman army had landed on the British shore and they marched northward towards the Thames River. And it was only there that Claudius would go and join them. So the Roman army then quickly overran a bunch of the different territory uh, of the, uh, the Catavallani with a victory that occurred at Caledon, uh, Camelodunum. This is near modern day Colchester. Afterwards, the army would then move north and west. And by 60 AD, a lot of Wales and essentially everything to the south was occupied. In addition to the direct Roman settlements that they would set up from here, they would also establish a number of different client kingdoms that were effectively subservient to Rome, including establishing this with the the Iceni at Norfolk and the Brigantes to the north. At the same time, one legion would still be sent northward with the future emperor Vespasian, uh, or no, one legion would go northward, and then another one under Vespasian would go southwest, and he would capture 20 tribal strongholds by himself. Cities such as London, which at the time was Londinium, because, you know, it's Latin names is what they have here. These became very valuable Roman territories because with their proximity to the channel, they were A, very populous, and B, allowed them to be able to control the region. I say control, though. Um, wasn't clean. The ancient British people were very warlike. And they always, always, always were ready to revolt and fight back. And that is actually what would happen with, uh, with a number of things. The Romans would face considerable resistance from them. As an example, there was one guy by the name of Catatacus, right? And he was a member of the Catavallani. And he would rally a lot of support in Wales, get defeated, get captured. And then once this would happen, he would escape and run north to the, uh, to the Brigantes, which were, remember, one of the client kingdoms that had been uh, established. And instead of helping them, or helping him like he begged, they instead turned him over to the Romans because they're like, yeah, no, fuck that. We're not fighting him. We're not doing that shit. Nobody wanted to fight the Romans? No one wanted to fight the Romans at the time here when it was just like on their own because a revolt had just been crushed. When a revolt is still going underway, you're more likely to be able to earn support but if you get horribly defeated and then go to ask for someone for help, they're less likely to help you in that scenario because you already proved that you lost once. And now they'll have to do it on their own and it starts to cycle over. Yeah. So then back in Rome, a triumph is held to glorify Claudius, but the captured chieftain was actually given the opportunity to address the Roman people, which was interesting. And I have no way to actually prove this quote is real or anything because it sounds way too fancy for him to just be able to say. But what he said was, and I quote to his, in his big speech, had my lineage and rank been accompanied by only moderate success, I would have come to the city as a friend rather than a prisoner. And you would not have disdained to ally yourself peacefully with one so nobly born. If I had surrendered without a blow before being brought before you, neither my downfall nor your triumph would have become famous. If you execute me, they will be forgotten. Spare me, and I shall become an everlasting token of your mercy. And all this was written down by Tacitus. Which, in other words, what that straight up means is, hey, the only reason that your victory meant anything is because I fought. If I hadn't fought you, you wouldn't have had anyone to fight, so therefore, it would have been too easy, and you wouldn't have had an actual triumph. There is no triumph without trial. I mean, he's not wrong. No, he's not actually wrong in that scenario. Like, there wouldn't have been a victory to, to glorify at all. They would have just marched in and people would have just been like, oh, yeah, hey, we're Roman now, I guess. Like, that's all that would have happened. So did they spare him? Well, interestingly, yeah. Actually, yeah. But not only him, the, the life of him, his wife, his daughter, his brothers, they were all spared by Claudius. So it could have been just some, like, massive political maneuver that was done at the time. And he could have not said any of these things in actuality. We don't know. We don't know. Again, in my opinion, it sounds a little bit too fancy, but that's just what happens. Either You're way. looking down on the rural tribesmen now. I kind of am, but also you have to think they didn't speak Latin. So like he's addressing this in a, in, to a crowd, speaking it in a way that they can understand what he's saying in the first place. Maybe he learned Latin. For diplomatic relations. Maybe he went to International School of Diplomacy. <laughs> this time, I, I don't think that they would have had that here for many more years. 
They would eventually in Britain uh, later on going into the dark ages, like they would have a whole bunch of stuff that would be dedicated specifically to Latin schools. When you do your master's on inter in international relations, are you going to learn languages so then we can become diplomat? You well, can become a diplomat. I'll just be your wife. They usually want you to have some kind of knowledge of a language of a place you'd be going. Like I'm not going to. I am not going to Japan. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was fun. It was it fun, was though, fun when we were but there. I have to live there. Well, yeah, no, there's a very key difference between visiting Japan and living in Japan. And for the most part, a I'm lot of people- I'm not taking a train everywhere. I will actually cry. <laughs> it was so crowded. I think in many scenarios, if, we, if you are a diplomat in a place, you're not going to be taking a public train. They won't know. I'm not the diplomat. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> so either way, while, Caritas, uh, while this guy's revolt was a failure, Rome still did have to deal with Bodica which was the entire point of talking about all of this in the first place. Okay, so anyway, when talking about Bodica, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. And there's not all that much information that really goes into this. The primary sources that we have that talk about Bodica's revolt are the Roman historians of Publius Cornelius Tacitus and Cassius Dio. That's pretty much where everything comes from. And the problem is, is that these are our two sources. And they have different stories for why anything even happened in the first place. See, Tacitus claims that the entire reason that the revolt even occurred in the first place is because of the ill treatment of the Iceni following the death of the previous king, which was Prasitagus, while Dio writes that it was a dispute over a loan. Interesting. Yeah. It's, we, we have no way to actually prove any of it. The other significant difference in the versions is that Dio makes no mention of the horrible treatment that Bodica faced, which is apparently that she was flogged and her daughters were raped in front of her. Which is a bit extreme, to say the least. Um, no, it, like there's all kinds of different issues here for the claiming. Also saying that she died from wounds in battle, not from poisoning. But between the two different accounts, the one that is generally accepted by most people is Tacitus, the more horrible one, arguably. And the reason being is that his father-in-law, Gnaeus Julius Agricola, was actually the governor in Britain who was chiefly responsible with um, the successful conquest and pacification of the region. And that is what would serve as the primary source of information for Tacitus. So uh, even then, I'm saying primary source. It's our primary source, but to them at the time, it was still a secondary source because it was, you know, being told the story of what happened from the previous guy. There really is no doubt that Agricola did participate in the suppression of Bodica because he served under Suetonius, who was a commander at the time, and he was a young soldier back in 61 AD. So it, even if the story is not true, it's more likely to be just from the information that we have. Anyway, getting into this, the actual story of the revolt. So Tacitus tells us, and this is the quote from him, it's directly from, his, uh, from the, uh, the annals of this. Prasitagus, king of the Iceni, after a, long, after a life of long and renowned prosperity, had made the emperor, so referring to Rome, co-heir with his two daughters. Prasitagus hoped that this submissiveness to preserve his kingdom and how... Or, or, I am butchering that in here. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I'm reading like directly from his quote now and it gets all fanciful for this. Okay. So I can read it. Okay. Do it. Do it, Gabby. Prasitagus hoped by this submissiveness to preserve his kingdom and household from attack, but it turned out otherwise. After his death, kingdom and household alike were plundered like prizes of war, the one by Roman officers, the other by Roman slaves. As a beginning, his widow Bodica was flogged and their daughters raped. The Icenian chiefs were deprived of their hereditary estates as if the Romans had been given the whole country. The king's own relatives were treated like slaves and the humiliated Iceni feared still worse now that they had been reduced to provincial status. So they rebelled. Yeah. So the, is, essentially the gist of it is what he had done is he divided his kingdom in half. He left half of the kingdom to the Roman emperor to be able to rule as like a gift to the Roman state, like a ceding of territory to establish peace. The other half he left to his daughters, right? But Rome saw this as an opportunity of like, free no, real estate. Free, yeah, it's free <laughs> real estate, basically. But even then, the description of what they did, like I completely understand rising up in revolt after this, like moving in, because it's just one of those cases of history of like, I love the Roman Empire. Uh, I love all the stories and everything that go, goes into all this. Red flag. They were 
Listen, they were massive dicks. So many of that. You don't build an empire without breaking a lot of people's, other people's eggs. I'm telling you that right now. Like, you know how there's the phrase, oh, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs uh, or without cracking a few eggs. In the case of an empire, you're primarily breaking other people's eggs. That's what you are doing. But this leads us into Boudicca's war. Yes. So in the case of going into Boudicca's war, she would first, after raising her army, go and strike the city of Camelodunum, which is again near modern Colchester. And there, she didn't just take over the settlement. This was about revenge. And so she proceeded to massacre every single inhabitant inside the settlement and burn it to the ground. There, there was no peace here. Governor Suetonius would engage in putting down, was already engaged in putting down an uprising in the island of Mana. So the Roman citizens tried to appeal to the imperial agent of Catus Decianus. And this guy, he sent a force of like 200 dudes thinking, oh yeah, no, this is totally going to be enough. Uh, that did not help worth crap for Against actually going Bodica? in. Yeah, because she had a force depending upon the, uh, like what the historians say, this could be, and I kid you not, anywhere between 20,000 and 200,000 men. And he sent 200. 200. Yes. Yes. And it's something that would only grow larger over time. So it might have started at like 20 to 40,000. And then it just grew bigger as she burned more stuff down and more tribes joined her in revolt. So anyway, the ninth Roman division, which was led by Rufus, would march to relieve the settlement. But they were routed because they did not have enough forces. And the infantry was utterly crushed by the British forces. So Suetonius returning then from Mona, would march to Londinium, and but upon receiving intelligence that Boudicca's forces far outnumbered his own, the man dipped. He, now, he didn't just abandon the settlement completely, like with the people. He, he essentially went out to the public and gave them the options and said, hey, guys, um, I'm not sticking around to defend you all here. So either you can pack up your stuff and flee and come with us, or tough luck. And a lot of people did end up leaving the settlement, but simultaneously, those who were old, sick, the women and children who were not able to really move as easily, a lot of these stayed behind. Believe it or not, even today when there's a migration event, women, children, you know, the elderly, disabled, they are the ones typically left behind, even in modern day. All throughout history. Because the younger that. men would be more likely to move because they can make a new life. And then women would probably be attached, held back, have less access to resources that would enable them to move. I also wrote a paper on that this week. Yep. So he then goes and tries to find a field of battle that is more, you know, beneficial to him, like more advantageous, like something that's a better position that they could actually fight in. Uh, and then once again, Bodica comes in, burns the settlement to the ground and massacres everyone inside. Like they, they are all killed. She is, th there's no such thing as an innocent for her. They are all equally like guilty Romans and they're going to be murdered and that's what they do. So it's, it's, it's not good. In addition to that, another city by the name of Verlamium would suffer the same fate. And while the British were dealing, not the British, I guess you should say that, but while these tribes were in the middle of destroying Verlamium, Suetonius would then choose another position that he could defend his own forces from which had a, it was like in a defile with woods behind him, which essentially means that on all sides, he couldn't be surprised or attacked. The enemy would have to come straight at him. There was no cover for ambushes or anything like that, at least according to Tacitus. So the Britons, after destroying the city, go and arrive in what is described as unprecedented numbers, just massive, massive amounts of numbers. But, and here's where the interesting thing is, and this is where I kind of believe where they talk about the size of the force of potentially being like, you know, one to 200,000. The British tribes were moving with such force and confidence, according to Tacitus, that they even brought their women and children with them. It was like one massive tribal migration of war. So it wasn't just fighting men, even if you want to assume from this that they had 50,000 fighting men, and then another double of that exact amount that was the women and children and others. That's who they were moving in with, right? So they 
had brought all their supply carts. Because think about this. They burned like three different cities, even more past this at this point to the ground. They stole all the stuff out of the cities. And they're taking these massive supply wagons with them filled with food, filled with resources, and filled with all of their loot that they took from the cities. And they put park those wagons behind their lines. This is going to end up being a massive problem. Before the battle, what is said to have happened is that both leaders encouraged and inspired their troops, and then Suetonius gave the signal for battle to commence. After this happened, the infantry would move forward and throw up their javelins, and Boudicca's superior numbers here meant absolutely nothing. Think about this. You have a force of, like, that outnumbers the enemy by, like, three, four, five, ten to one, right? But they've chosen a field of battle where all of your forces are condensed into a block where they're closer together. So the Romans start chucking their javelins, which is like the pilums and everything that they have. And there is really no way to defend against this because you are blocked up in one massive flesh block. They didn't have shields? Yeah, they did. They did. But the problem is, is that even then, it's still going to penetrate and hit in some areas. I feel like if it's so narrow, you just make a ginormous shield wall. Mm Mm-hmm. The way that the Romans worked, and that's a great point. And then you just make rows of shield wall. Sorry to the guys in the front. Mm -hmm. Shields were also kind of expensive. So people didn't necessarily have them. You had the warriors who would, but remember, a lot of forces were lightly armed tribesmen that they themselves would fight with javelins and like spears with no shield. Hell, a lot of them didn't have armor. They would be like shirtless. Did the Romans have shields? Oh yeah, they did. They had a, a very large shield called a scutum. That if I was holding this up, I mean, obviously I'm bigger than the average Roman was at the time, but <laughs> that's bold. To wow. Yeah, no, I am. I'm 5'11. Thank you very much. They were on average like five feet tall. Okay. But the thing is the, the scutum would go with, they were, they were holding out properly. It could almost be rested on the ground at times if they had to. But if I was holding it out, it would go from like my neck down to like my thigh. Not I mean my, like my thigh, like even to my knee. It was a very big shield, right? So the shields that the British, (laughs) you look good there, Gabby. Thank you. She put on the Roman helmet for anyone who is listening to this for just the podcast. (laughs) But anyway, they, a lot of the people were lightly armed tribesmen. And so the javelins would rip into them. And even among the ones who did have shields, the pilums, the pilum javelins of the Romans were designed in such a way that they had a soft metal tip so that when it hit, they would bend so the javelins couldn't really be pulled out and then thrown back at the enemy. And so if you have two or three javelins that are wedged in your shield, your shield now went from a six pound thing on your arm to a 12 pound thing on your arm that is way harder to maneuver. That's kind of like the issue. The more of those that are embedded, the less that you can use it, which means that now they don't have a shield to actually protect them. Did they, they, they were fighting with javelins too. So I don't. They would, but way better technology on the Roman side, way better construction, way better strength generally to be able to do things. It was an organized army versus a ragtag band of tribes. Correct. Men. Especially with how they were positioned. So it wasn't good. So this is something that completely cut down the advancing wedge formation and it cut through their ranks. And then Suetonius then ordered the auxiliary infantry and then his cavalry to charge. This almost immediately routed the Britons who turned and fled. But remember that supply train that I talked about, the thing that was behind them? Oh, so they can't escape. Couldn't escape. It created a literal artificial wall behind them that blocked their escape. And that is something that turned a battle into what effectively was a massacre. As Tacitus would write about this, the remaining Britons fled with difficulty since their ring of wagons blocked the outlets. The Roman did not spare even the women. Baggage animals, too, transfixed with weapons, added to the heaps of dead. Bodica and her daughters who were there apparently managed to escape, but soon afterwards, knowing that they weren't actually going to be able to do anything, poisoned themselves in order to make sure that they couldn't be captured and then marched back to Rome in triumph. And also potentially raped again. Can we trust Tacitus because wasn't he Roman? Yeah, but that's pretty much the only source that we have from any of this. You also have to remember that the ancient Brits at this time didn't really have writing. Like they, 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 like the Druid religion and everything that was common throughout all this time is mostly oral tradition. We don't have a lot of writings. 
about the things that would occur at that time. Are there any oral tradition that ended up being written down about this? Hell, we don't, we can't even pinpoint where this battle took place. That's the frustrating. So the name of this battle is called the Battle of Watling Street. We don't know where that is. Like it's referred to as the Battle of Watling Street. And that's all we pretty much know. And there have been a bunch of different suggestions like that. It's um, it could be from King's Cross in London to Church Stowe near uh, Northamptonshire. But we don't know. We just don't know. That's the big problem. And so the battle. Apparently of, it's in East Chicago, Illinois. Illinois. The lie. No, Indiana. Indiana. Yeah. Oh my God. It's settled. Rome, no, Illinois. Rome was America all along. We should have known. <laughs> I love how you just looked it up. It has to be I N though. It's Indiana, right? Yeah. Watling's, but why is it called Chicago? Watling Street, Indiana. Uh, I N is Indiana, right? Yeah, it is. And I L is Illinois. Yes. But isn't Chicago in Illinois? Yeah, it is. So why does it say East Chicago, Indiana? Because these, like, hold on. I'm it, so it, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I know this is detracting from all this, but I have to look this up right I'm now so because this sorry. is going to bother me. I did me. not mean to cause this. This is going to bother me because if I, if I recall correctly, if I go all the way up here to the north, right? So it's like below Chicago and then. It's one of those tri-state areas or bi-state areas, isn't it? Yeah. Like, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Go, going up. Yeah. Gabby. Gabby, because Indianapolis, Indiana, Chicago okay, is Okay, so it's literally right, right between. There. I was so confused because I'm looking at the map and it's Illinois and then Indiana, right? Yeah. Chicago is one of those cities that has grown so big that it, after its initial point, which was further up in Illinois, it grew to eventually also include parts of Indiana. Okay, perfect. Um, so it's in Ilniana. Ilniana, yes, yes. The ancient Roman settlement of Ilniana. If it sounds right. Thanks. You're welcome, historians. I did my part. Actually, it was Apple Maps. I don't want to take their credit. <laughs> and so the Battle of Watling Street, though, though, this was the last serious threat to Roman authority. Really, nothing else past this would ever be that great, at least in terms of the lower, like, southern threshold of England. Everything in the north was going to be a little bit of a problem still. And aside from his victory over Boudicca, in his desire to strengthen the Roman presence, Polinius would also eliminate the Druid stronghold at Anglesey. And the Druid religion, which was always something that because of, you know, it being practiced by all these local tribes out on the fringes, that was something that was still considered to be kind of a threat to Rome and its system. So they persecuted these people vigorously. And accordingly, the governor then responded to all this by crushing all of these people. Like they just moved on afterwards and not just revolt, but like started. It's going to sound bad. This is the phrase that they would use at the time. Pacifying the countryside. Can you imagine what that means? It means a whole lot of murder. At least it didn't say huffing them out. That would have not been great. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. This was so bad. He was so brutal in everything snuffing? that he did. Snuffing. That's the term. Yeah. Snuffing them out. That's what that would mean. So he, this was so bad that the, when the Senate heard about this, they ended up recalling him and he was replaced by a guy called Terpolanus. And this would end up being a little bit of a change in how Rome would treat Britain. It was no longer just a place to conquer. It was something that over time would gradually begin to Romanize. Gradually, Britons were adopting Roman ways and with a stronger presence in Britain because they had to maintain several legions there simultaneously in order to keep things pacified, Rome would begin to make very significant changes. All those burnt settlements that they had before were rebuilt. Um, the, they, they, they built baths. They had all these governor estates. They were building bridges across the Thames. They were building all these varying things. And the British over this time, all the tribes, would gradually become Roman. And although progress was really slow, Rome largely still considered the conquest of Britain to be necessary. Remember, 100 years ago, they thought that the entire thing was pointless because, you know, it didn't it barely had anything in terms of resources. And while a lot of people had dismissed it as being something that was without value, it did have a lot of mineral wealth still. And milk. And milk. Tin, iron, gold. It did also have hunting dogs and slaves. That whole thing for slaves was still something that was very valuable for Rome to be able to use. They built roads. They linked all these other settlements. It was something that was successful. And from that, you would see a 
growing economy develop within the society that would be positive. At least that's the best way it is that I can describe. But, and this is a big but, simultaneously, the British were always still very resistant peoples. And this meant that they always had to have extra military forces there in order to make sure that things were pacified so that there wasn't A, another revolt, and B, because all those outside tribes that were in like Ibernia, you know, which was uh, Ireland and going up into Caledonia with Scotland, they wanted to make sure that those people didn't attack. Because guess what? They attacked a lot. So anyway, moving on from that here, after all the revolts from 77 to 83 AD, the military commander of Gnaeus Julius Agricola, which ironically, remember, that's the guy we talked about before, the father-in-law of Tacitus. He is the one who would serve as governor. And it wasn't Agricola's first time in Britain, as we talked about, because remember, he served as that young soldier during the earlier campaigns. The, the thing is, is that in a series of conflicts that would follow all of this, Agricola was able to achieve victory, subdue Northern Wales, and finally end up meeting the Caledonians, the ones who were constantly a threat to the North at Mons Grappius. The governor also even eyed the neighboring islands of Ireland, and he claimed at the time that Ireland was so weak, it was so ripe for the taking, that he only needed one legion in order to be able to take it. Unfortunately, though, this wouldn't actually end up happening. Agricola was forced to withdraw from Scotland when one of his legions was recalled by Emperor Domitian, in order to confront with uh, the tribes that were starting to migrate to move across the Danube. However, despite his attacks against any rebelling forces or in his expansion, Agricola wasn't a guy who was a cruel conqueror, right? Aside from the forts that he built in the north, he tried to civilize things, which, I mean, to be fair, Romans and civilizing things was something that they often try, try, tried to do, and it uh, usually ended well, for those that would convert, those that did not, it did not end well for. But over time, they would urbanize and Romanize a lot of the British population. The issue was, is that unfortunately, his success was not something that went unnoticed by Emperor Domitian. And there's a bit of a problem with that. See, emperors did not like it when generals had a very easy time assuming glory and doing great things and earning popularity among people. Because when they did this, that meant that potentially they were going to be a threat. And so Domitian, in a fit of jealousy, recalled him. All that here, like him being a governor, him doing all this, he did such a good job that he got punished. Because now potentially he could have been a threat. The territory that he desired to take, like going into Scotland and whatnot, this was something that would not be conquered for many more years. And even then, the Romans were never actually able to hold this. That, in turn, is what then led to the creation of Hadrian's Wall. Remember, like that low turf wall that went across everything for the northern border? And then I can't remember the name of the wall that they moved beyond that with. There was another wall that they moved to the north that they couldn't actually hold, even though, technically speaking, it would have been a shorter wall and easier to maintain. Interesting little detail, because a lot of people think that the like, Hadrian's Wall was a system kind of like the Great Wall of China, where it was actually a massive wall. The walls were never that big. Instead, it was something that was more of a, a slight delaying tactic. And simultaneously, they would have forts every like, God, I can't even remember the amount of distance that it was, like 20 miles or something. It would be a fort with military units stationed inside. So they can guard get the easy border. access to get to different parts of the wall. Right? Yeah. And so that way it would delay them. The enemy force would have to siege that or try to take it. And this would allow time for a legion to make its way north to actually be able to fight. Was it like a boundary suggestion? Like, hey, don't cross there. This is Roman territory. Kind of both. Yeah. So it was both a security system and also a uh, like a warning system. It was an alert system. It was everything. That's pretty much what that was. And this is the way that things would proceed here for quite a while. Right. That's just what would happen. It would take years to build and it would be manned by around 15,000 soldiers. It's just, it was something pretty much only for surveillance patrols. By the year 130 AD, military garrisons had been established throughout all of Britain though. And at this time, Rome realized that they would need to further strengthen their army on the European continent and gradually began to recruit from all the varying different barbarian tribes that were not fully Romanized. A lot of these came from Britain, from the Balkans, from all these varying outside far-flung territories. In 139, oh, and this is where I'd put it, in, a, in 139, this is where they then built the next wall, the Antonine one, 
but that was something that was literally abandoned after like 20 years. They could not maintain it. It was just way too hostile to the North. As time would pass on going into the third and fourth century, further changes would come to the island because in order to rule more efficiently, the island was divided in half. You had Britannia Inferior that was governed from York, which is Ebercarum, and you had Emperor Diocletian who would later divide the province into four separate regions. And because of Diocletian's tetrarchy, which was literally the rule of four emperors. That doesn't sound confusing at all. I need to do a whole episode on that because (laughs) that whole thing was a massive pain in the ass. It really was. Britain was then placed under the watchful eye of the Emperor of the West. So that was who in charge there. Trouble would over time continue to haunt Britain. During the third century, the island was almost under constant attack from the northern forces of the Picts the people that would later go on to be, you know, the Scots. But I say that the Picts were a completely separate group. A lot of people would get confused with this. They think of like, oh, Scotland, like the Scots. Scots were actually Northern Irish and they migrated over, took over things in Pictland and that's what created Scotland because the Scots were Northern Irish, the whole other tribal group. I'm not trying to rush you, but I think the camera's going to die. Oh, the camera's probably going to die at this point in here. That is how things would essentially move on uh, for centuries afterwards. And at this point, I'm going to fast forward through all this. They had the Saxons from Germany. They had the Saxons from Germany. So you had the Angles, the Jutes, the Saxons, the Gits. They had all these varying tribes that moved in. Um, Rome would gradually lose a lot of its territory and influence. Because remember, as you said from the beginning, when they stop expanding, this means no money. No money means no ability to pay your army. They gradually lost a lot of their efficiency and power and strength, their military forces. And from there... Uh, they eventually had to pull out. I can't even remember what the exact year was that they pulled out. I know that I put it in here for specifically the year. Yeah, after 410, the Western half of the empire began to undergo significant changes. And then it was later on in the empire. Ah, where was it? I know I had put this in. Yeah, in 410 AD, Honorius, one of the last emperors of the West, would pull out completely out out of Britain. And from then on, I kid you not, The guy who was the governor, the guy who was in charge there in that region, did a very bold move of writing to all the leaders of the varying cities around and basically said, fend for yourself. That was it? That's it. They just just pulled out, they left their people and they were like, figure it out. They did. And from then on, you would see gradually things would fall apart. Uh, It would form into different kingdoms. They did all that murder for what? I mean, they controlled it for several hundred years. And here's the problem. And this is where I would say this. Remember how Britain was valuable in terms of territory for like mineral resources? Because of the amount of military units that had to be stationed in Rome or stationed from Rome there, it was almost always a loss. So the province cost more to maintain from its mills than it gave back. It wasn't like one of the regions where they got a lot of food or a lot of, I don't know. They still needed the resource. Like they needed the tin. They needed everything from there for their industry. So they had to maintain it. But they were paying more to maintain it than they were getting that back. Correct. Correct. Egypt was the most valuable province in the entire Didn't they lose thing. Egypt and that led to the collapse because that, it was the breadbasket of Rome? That's one of the things that caused the everything for the Byzant- Byzantine Empire, the eastern half. The loss of Egypt was the greatest loss to the empire. And then it just started. Everything just fell apart after that. I mean, if you lose a major source of your food, then how are you going to feed your people? Correct. And they can't maintain the same, the same cities, armies, everything else. Okay. Uh, yeah, we kind of, we kind of got cut off there here. The camera literally died as I we were trying say, to I did say, cause uh, we, we, this is our first time using this setup. So I took a little bit of setting up to do. And yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is, that is, for all those who are watching probably this on YouTube, and I know that there's going to be a little bit of an awkward cut or jump at some point in here. I'm sorry, guys, we're going to get a lot better at this. But basically what we were saying in the end is I was trying to rush through the final years of British history and everything that was happening. Yeah, everything gets abandoned. The people are told to basically fend for themselves and Rome pulls out never to return again to Britain. And from there, it breaks apart into all the individual little kingdoms. And past that you they would just have the legacy of rome you'd have for years afterwards they would have um all these old buildings and everything and there there are stories of hundreds of years later just like the people seeing these ruins for the first time at the time just marveling at them there was a as an example in britain there is a place called bath do you know why it was called bath why because the romans built a giant bath there and it became known like that's why the city got the name like 
basically bath. That's, that's one of the key reasons as to why <laughs> I kid you not. So anyway, as we are ending things in here today, I thank all of you who have been watching before we go and finish this off completely though, it is time for us to bring back the fabled section of the family history. And to that end, I'm actually going to be pulling up the one here I had now, which technically speaking, I probably should have done that anyway. But now at this point, I'm just going to be rambling while I try and delay things for the next five seconds while I struggle to try and bring this up. And there it is. I got it. Fantastic. Beautiful. You're doing great. I'm doing great. So, what? okay, it's on camera. I can actually see that now, not just. What? Okay. This one says, hello, Stephen and Gabby. My name is Isaac Angelo. I am a logic and Latin teacher, part-time blacksmith and lover of history. That's cool. I've been listening to the podcast for about a year now, and I used to listen to the old episodes whenever I was drinking or working in my forge. But sadly, I eventually ran out of old episodes to listen to after consuming them all. <laughs> yeah, that, that tends to happen here. But luckily, we've been doing this for a while, so I'm, I'm glad that you've been listening here for a long time. I thoroughly enjoyed the podcast, and I especially love the family histories. It always fascinates to hear the largely untold stories that can be found in every family. This is very true. It's beautiful to me how everyone has a story to tell and how they all met, uh, how they all melt together into a grand story of history. Anyway, I figured I'd share some disjointed stories from my own family's history, and maybe they'll be interesting as well. I'll start with my dad's side of the family, which I know the least about. As you may have guessed from my last name, my father's side of the family is Italian. As the Angelo, I haven't been able to find out exactly when my part of the Angelo family immigrated from Italy to America, but I do know that it occurred sometime in the mid to late 19th century. I was told that my grandfather, or I was told by my grandfather, that for a few decades around the turn of the century, my ancestors were quite significantly involved in the Virginia Mafia. Wait, Virgi okay. <laughs> Although I'm not sure at what level. Eventually, <laughs> some of the family moved to Texas, where my grandfather and then my father were born. I don't know much about my paternal grandmother's family, but her maiden name was Morgan, and I know her family was part of a group of German immigrants to Oklahoma. My mother's father's last name was Pointevin. Apparently, there is a museum about the Pointevin family somewhere in Louisiana. That is cool. That is crazy, but I have not been there yet. The Pointevin family began in Potoa. Wait, uh, P-O-I-T-O-U. I've always seen that. I've never known how to actually pronounce that. Potoa? Potoa? I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's the region in France spelled P-O-I-T-O-U. I hate French pronunciation. In the 13th century, and they were so named because they spoke a certain dialect called Potevin. Eventually, my part of the family immigrated to Florida and were some of the 40 survivors of the Fort Caroline Massacre in 1565 in which the Spanish, led by Pedro Menendez, murdered 140 French Huguenots in an attempt to end French colonization of Florida. Ouch. Ironically, I was born and raised in St. Augustine, the first landing site of Pedro Menendez, where every other building is named after him. Anyway, the survivors escaped, and some made their way to Louisiana, where the point of it family mixed with the other French settlers, as well as quite a few Scotch-Irish. Eventually, the Point of it family grew and spread across America, and one notable Point of it ancestor was Eliza Jane Point of it, who was the first female newspaper editor in the United States. Interesting. She worked for the Picayune Times under the pen name Pearl Rivers, and so the Point of it line continued down to my great-grandfather, Adolf Point of it, who served in the Coast Guard during World War II. His son, my grandfather, would serve in the Army, Following the war, he was stationed in Germany during the occupation. There, he would meet my grandmother, who was born and raised in Germany during the war. My grandfather has many stories, too. many Too many to include here about life in 1940s Germany. Or not grandfather, grandmother, of course. She told me about her core childhood memories, getting shot at by Russian soldiers in passing trains as she picked potatoes for dinner. Yeah, no, they, they freaking hated the Germans. They, 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 there was no peace for them. That makes sense budgeting two squares of toilet paper per person per day and running to the Frankfurt bomb shelter at any given time of day or night. She has a scar on her shoulder from where she was inoculated in the bomb shelter. Everyone in the bomb shelter was inoculated with the same knife, which was briefly held over a flame to sanitize it between use. What? Yeah, because what they used to do for anything like uh, is they would straight up like cut you and then inoculation was to insert yeah, something under your skin. But um. 
the knife is what got me. I know how inoculation works, but the knife. Well, according, well, listen to this. Apparently that wasn't enough because she still developed an infection, which nearly took her arm. Yeah. A lot of my family had smallpox. Yeah. Like, not my, like, current family, but that. She was then left with a divot on the backside of her shoulder the size of a silver dollar. Ooh. One story which always stood out to me as a child was the story of how rare true Nazism was in Germany. It was really only the people in power who held on to the ideals and a few civilians who made up their small numbers with noise. Out of her entire family and neighborhood, only her grandfather was a Nazi. Ironically, he was also named Adolf. And as soon as he began supporting the cause... Her grandmother kicked him out of the house and he was ostracized from the community. My grandmother's cousin was also named Adolf. And I find it humorous how common the name Adolf was back in those days. Yeah. Because Adolf, Adolf is like, I feel like, I think. Naming a kid that nowadays would be the worst. Some couple straight up named their kid Adolf Hitler. Like they named him that. I'm sure the government made them change it. Not because they were Nazis. I can't even remember if they did or not. But um, one dad named his kid loser and winner. Oh God. God damn. So I find it how humorous the, and common the name Adolf was in those days. It was almost the equivalent of John in America. I have five Johns in my family that I know of and at least four Adolfs among my ancestors. The only difference is that people are still naming their children John, but you'd be hard pressed to find a kid named Adolf. Her father was drafted into the German army and taken as a prisoner of war in the Battle of Stalingrad. He then served the duration of the war working in a Russian coal mine where he developed black lung disease and died shortly after returning home when the war ended. One thing he told my grandmother stuck with her, and it sticks with me as well. He said, very few of the conscripts of the German army believed in the Nazi cause. We only cooperated for fear of death. But let me tell you this, not every Nazi official who died in battle was shot by the other side. Yeah, especially for one of the ones like the political officers in there. Oh, yeah. After my grandfather met my grandmother, he took her home with him back to America and married her. There, she would face extreme prejudice from everyone who had lost family members in the two world wars. And in spite of this, she found a community in the world of healthcare and overcame the stigma surrounding her nationality. I'm constantly inspired by my grandmother and the resilience that she and her German family showed throughout the war. Anyways, I know this was a lot of stories. Yep, it was a lot of good ones with little connection, but I hope you enjoyed hearing about the wonderful mess that is my family history. Thank you, all of you. Gabby and James do to, or thank you for all that you, Gabby and James do to entertain and educate us all. I look forward to hearing on the next episode of the history of everything. Isaac Angelo. Thank you, Isaac. That was really nice. Sorry, if I look distracted there for a little bit, your mom just got hit. Oh, oh that's why the dog was going off. And no one was letting her in. Oh my so God. I had to call my mom. Oh, well, anyway, guys, I have to go say hi to my mother in here and uh, then pick up my daughter from school. Thank you all, everyone, for joining with us. I appreciate all of you, my hosts. Goodbye. Bye.